working here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And I'm just delighted to see so many of you brave souls on this beautiful day to, that you've come into the museum. However, you're in for a big treat. So before we begin, I do want to uh, ask you if you would turn off your cell phones and any other electronic devices and, you know, wings up any moment here. But please do turn off your cell phones and, uh, as a courtesy to others and to our speaker. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Julian Cox. He is here as one of our Distinguished Curator's Choice Lecturers. And he's lecturing, of course, in conjunction with the exhibition, This World is Not My Home, Danny Lyon Photographs. The exhibition comes to us from the Manil Collection in Houston. And we have been privileged to purchase the Civil Rights Portfolio. So it's a very powerful exhibition. And I invite you to go see it after the, after the talk, if you haven't seen it already. Julian Cox joined the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco in fall of 2010 as its founding curator of photography and chief curator. He's been very busy. He was educated in Great Britain and holds a BA in Art History from the University of Manchester and a Master's of Philosophy in the History of Photography from the University College of Wales. After holding curatorial <laughs> positions at the National Library of Wales, and the National Museum of, film, of Photography, Film, and Television in Bradford, England, he moved to the United States in 1992 to, pers to pursue his career. For more than a decade, he worked with the photographs collection at that other institution down the road, about 90 miles from here, sitting on a hill, <laughs> the J. Paul Getty Museum, which has uh, about 160,000 photographs, just slightly more than we do. Um, and then he spent five years leading the photography program at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. During that time, he's organized numerous exhibitions on subjects ranging from the dawn of photography's invention in Europe in the 19th century to contemporary practice in the United States. Joining the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, he's organized and hosted several exhibitions, including Ralph Eugene Meteor, Dolls and Masks, Man Ray, Lee Miller, Partners in Surrealism, the, this World is Not My Home, Danny Lyon Photographs, and most recently and on view now, Eye Level in Iraq, photographs by Carl Alford and Thorne Anderson, and it just opened this week. It's a very powerful show. Julian is the co-author with Colin Ford of the critically acclaimed publication Julia Margaret Cameron, The Complete Photographs in 2003, and many of you in my collector's group may remember that we went to the Getty and Julian gave us a wonderful personal tour of that exhibition that accompanied his book. He has also published The Portrait Unbound, photographs by Robert Weingarten in 2010, Road to Freedom, photographs of the Civil Rights Movement, 1956 to 1968, and Harry Callahan, Eleanor, in 2007. This spring, the University of South Carolina will publish his latest book, Controversy and Hope, The Civil Rights Photographs of James Corrales. So I am so pleased and honored to welcome Julian Cox. Thank you, Karen, for that lovely introduction. And uh, a real pleasure to be back in Santa Barbara. It's a beautiful place, and a uh, place I used to visit quite regularly when I lived uh, few miles down the road in Los Angeles, so really delighted to be back. And, and uh, about an hour ago, I walked through the exhibition with Karen, and it just looks fabulous. If you haven't seen it already, you must see it. She's done a beautiful job uh, in installing the show and augmenting it with the, this very important civil rights portfolio that I understand has recently been added to the museum's collection. And it's, uh, it adds so much to the presentation that we, we weren't able to show it in uh, San Francisco, where this show was uh, on view a few months ago. And uh, it just sort of fleshes out the significance of this artist in a really uh, important way. So bravo to her for making that happen. Um, you are looking at a picture of Danny Lyon on his motorbike at age 23. Uh, he had just come back from the South and sort of completed his work in the Civil Rights Movement, which will be a focus of my talk today. But uh, it gives you a good sense of his personality. He, he's sort of a somewhere between uh, James Dean, you think about uh, the Rebel Without a Course from 1955, and uh, you th then you think about Easy Rider, which is 1969, he's sort of sandwiched in the middle of that great film with Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda and Jack Nicholson. Uh, so, and he's surrounded, this is a montage, a photo montage that he made 
uh, in, the, in the later years, actually, in the mid-80s, but he's surrounded here by contact prints, small, square, two and a quarter inch contact prints from a series that's called Uptown, a series of pictures he made in Chicago, where he was, in a sense, beginning to uh, try to decide for himself what he would do next as a, as a young photographer who had already accomplished a great deal by photographing in the American South, but was about to move forward and, and uh, make some extraordinary uh, new bodies of work. Um, one of which was the bike riders, which is superbly presented in the museum here. The first garret you go into when you get off the elevator, you're surrounded by about a dozen pictures from this uh, seminal body of work. It was, he published a very important book with it, which has gone into multiple editions. And uh, this is the kind of uh, epitome of, of his sort of uh, his fascination and love of freedom. I mean, really, in a way, his work over 40 years is in his early 70s now. Um, his work over 40 years has been about, I think, investigating the concept of freedom um, from the different sides of that definition, and we'll, I'll talk more about that as we go forward. But this is the sort of iconic image from that body of work, the bike riders, that he made around 1965, 1966. So the, the pictures that you just saw on the first slide, those portraits that he made around Chicago, he, simultaneously he was also um, embedding himself with the Outlaws uh, biker um, outfit, in, which was based in Chicago, but sort of fanned out throughout the Midwest. And um, he was a bike rider himself, as you just see. And this became a, a major body of work for him and has, has entered really the history of photography, 20th century American photography as being you know, one of the most important photo books of, of the middle part of the century. He then moved on uh, to, to make important work in, in Texas, uh, investigating the prison system in that state. And actually, you heard from Karen, she, she mentioned that this exhibition was organized by the Manil Collection in Houston. And uh, that institution, very early on, uh, supported his work in a very powerful way, which is why they have a significant holding of his photographs. Um, Mrs. de Manil uh, was very interested in African culture and African-American culture. And uh, she had seen his civil rights issues <coughs> and thought they were powerful and important and helped to fund the work that he went on to make in the Texas prison system, which is, a, is another iconic body of work from the middle of the century and uh, probably amongst the greatest things that he ever made. He spent 14 months in and out of the prison system there and made many hundreds of photographs which were edited into the book, which is now impossible to get. It's out of print. and available for thousands of dollars, usually on eBay or in the, um, in the, in the uh, rare book market, and uh, has been incredibly influential to a whole generation of younger photographic artists. Um, here's another picture on the left-hand side from that same series uh, that he made, again, 1967-68. And uh, he wrote this wonderful book that was published just a few years ago now, I guess five, six years ago now, called Like a Thief's Dream, which was, uh, if you... It's, I would really encourage you to get a copy of it if you're interested in this subject that he spent so much time thinking about because it, it consists of correspondence between himself and a prisoner by the name of Jimmy Renton, the chap who you see in the lower part of the, the composition here, the lower part of the talk cover. Uh, he was a, a serial killer, a lifetime multiple offender who had several life sentences, but um, Daddy Lyon met him in the early 60s when he went into the prison system and they became very close friends and they maintained a correspondence over years and whenever Daddy would come back to Texas, he would go and visit him and they had this very sort of powerful bond actually and when Renton finally died in behind bars, he was still a prisoner when he died, uh, his, his correspondence and his personal possessions were signed over to Danny Lyon as, as uh, his next of kin. And so he wrote this very moving, very profound book, which is a series of, 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 a, of correspondence exchanges between himself and, and this prisoner. And it, it really sort of digs into the psychology of incarceration and, and, this, and the struggle for freedom that every prisoner um, faces. And so that comes back to my earlier comment about the notion of freedom. So the, the, the bike rider who sort of has the ultimate freedom on there with the wind going through their hair and the open road, and then the prisoner who is completely um, at the opposite end of that spectrum, and those sort of polarities are typify the, the sort of range that, that, that Danny Lyon has as an artist. Um, this is an album page uh, from an album, a personal album that Jimmy Renton, the prisoner I just mentioned, 
um, had when uh, he was behind bars, and, and it entirely consists of photographs of Danny Mine and his family. So this is Danny over here. Um, reflect, you see him holding his camera, his wife in the background, and these are his children here. Um, here he is sort of lying with his eldest daughter, Rachel. This is his son. And then this is him down here in the left-hand corner. You'll see some other images in a second in New Mexico. Um, he has lived for about 40 years in a small little community called Bernalillo, which is about 20 miles away from Albuquerque. And um, you know, he sent these kinds of pictures to Renton as a way for him to understand what was happening in his life and to sort of include him in the larger world that he was having no experience of as a, as a person who was incarcerated. So um, this, these kinds of relationships are, um, for someone like Danny Lyon, a very important underpinning to who he is as a person, but also how he works. And we'll, we'll look at more of that as we go forward. Um, one of the things that is on view in the exhibition, which is really quite beautiful, are uh, two or three of his personal family albums. So these are, this is just a spread from uh, one of them. And you see Danny here, oh, oh sorry, um, with his dog, one of his seven dogs up here. Uh, this is a field of the dobies, uh, sort of being dug out of the, the ground in New Mexico. Down here, a chap called Eduardo Rivera, who was um, an illegal immigrant from uh, Chihuahua, Mexico, who Danny Lyme would bring back and forth across the border every season to help him build his home and to provide work for him. Um, the, the text that you can't really see because the slide uh, underneath each image gives you information about this particular person, different elements of his personal life. So this one here describes the fact that Eddie has three daughters and he sent them all to college back in Mexico based on the employment that he's gained through Daniel Lyon and other people in this community in New Mexico where he comes to every season to, to get work. And so, um, you know, the, at the moment in our culture there's a, a lot of discussion or debate around the issue of immigration and this is something that Daniel Lyon has been engaged with in, in a very personal kind of way for many, many years. And, uh, has, as I mentioned, lived in, in this part of the country for four decades. And, and, uh, and that sort of other side of America, that kind of Latino, Hispanic, Chicano side of America is, is something that's fascinated him for many years too. This is a picture that he made in a small little community of Yanito, which is uh, about a mile away from where he lives now. Uh, he, he chose uh, these folks as his subject matter. Uh, he became very friendly with a lot of the young boys, the teenagers there, and would frequent the, the cemetery and sort of got involved with all the families who had generations of different uh, family members buried in the local cemetery. And you'll see that the, some of these individual images here being then incorporated in a photo montage like this uh, several years later. This one is for Johnny Sanchez, one of the young boys um, in, in the community who was actually died in a head-on collision about, about five, or, or five or six years after the, pic the initial pictures were taken. So it's a kind of uh, memento mori to this guy's life. And, uh, but, but most importantly, it gives you a sense of, of Lyon's emotional connection to his subjects and how uh, these people weren't just sort of transitory figures in his life, but they were deeply embedded in his sort of psychology, his way of looking at the world. And this is an important part of his uh, sort of strategy as a picture maker. It's what makes, I think, in one way, his pictures so uh, powerful and, and, and resonant. Um, another photo collage that, that um, has a different cast of characters. This time, he's, uh, there's uh, this woman standing here is Paula Cooper, one of the preeminent uh, contemporary art gallerists in New York City. She's in her early 70s now, but um, she brought forward uh, many important careers uh, from the 60s onwards, and she was a close friend of Daddy Lyons when he was in New York. Uh, this is Robert Frank, the photographer Robert Frank down here, the writer Ken Casey here that Danny Lyons is talking to. Uh, and then this is Danny fishing, he loves fishing on his boat here. And then here he is in prison with Jimmy Renton. So this is Danny in the back in the middle there, sort of underneath the bunk bed. Uh, and he, when he was in the Texas prisons he made photographs but he also made audio recordings and film recordings. Um, of the life of the prisoners. So um, I, I love this piece because it shows you how all these sort of 
motley, diverse um, elements are kind of integrated into his his way of looking at the world, and, and each of these personalities have sort of equal are of equal significance in some way too. And, and uh, this is his his girlfriend Rachel in the middle, but they're all sort of orbiting around this one figure in the centre of the composition. But they they are you know each each of these personalities, each of these places in the world is is a key part of his of his uh, way of looking at the world, key part of his life experience. He also made films, and many of them. Uh, Danny Lyons published about about twelve books uh, on his photography over the years, but he's also made a similar number of films, and they don't often get seen that much because they were shot on um, 16 millimeter and 8 millimeter, and they're difficult to see. But um, he loved filmmaking. He actually taught Robert Frank how to how to, how to make films. Um, they lived for a while together in New York City and um, shared a lot of conversations and um, ideas about what filmmaking should be. Uh, and he made, a, I showed you a picture that was titled Yanito a few minutes ago. This is a film <coughs> about the uh, community, uh, the characters of, of the town of, of Yanito, which he made in 1971, just a couple of years after he settled in New Mexico. And then a film from a decade later called Born to Film, which is um, from 82, and that's much more personal, really, very autobiographical. It's really about his relationship with his family. And at this point, at this point, he was beginning to um, have children and, and make a family. And so, this is a very personal kind of film, and it's set again in all around his uh, the uh, his property in New Mexico, uh, which is about maybe five or six acres, and it's right next to um, a uh, an Indian reservation. And he maintains close friendships with with uh, that community uh, even today. And then sort of bringing things up to the present moment, this is the most recent body of work that he created in China. He traveled there pretty extensively from 2005 to 2007 um, and created a book called Deep Sea Diver. Uh, and this body of work is, is really very personal, very autobiographical. He, he grew up in Queens, New York, uh, Danny Lyon did. And, uh, you know, he, he was deeply deeply impacted by the photography of the Depression era in America, uh, the work of Dorothea Lang, Walker Evans, and, and such characters. And, and also had seen a lot of the work of, of um, Henri Cartier-Bresson in magazines like Life and Look and so forth. And in many ways, and, and uh, uh, Cartier-Bresson had traveled to China and made really important pictures there in the 50s and early 60s. And so this was a kind of, uh, Odyssey for him, a kind of pilgrimage to China to see what he could find and to investigate parts of the of the country that were had been neglected by this incredible uh, rise in, in the major urban cities like Beijing and Shanghai and the, and the depopulation of the rural areas into those large cities. So um, he hired you know cab drivers and translators and went really out into the middle of nowhere in China and produced this this body of work that really doesn't look like 2005, 2007, it sort of looks like 1950, really. So um, he wanted to sort of plumb the depths of, of that community and, and and see what was there and, and to see, you know, really, to sort of look backwards in time, I guess you could say. Um, and these are the uh, some of the most contemporary photographs that are in the exhibition upstairs. So that's a very quick sort of capsule look at, at uh, the the life of Danny Lyon. We're going to sort of change um, uh, focus now for a second and look more at uh, the civil rights era. Um, and, and this part of my, my talk is in large part stems from research conducted in conjunction with the exhibition Road to Freedom, photographs of the civil rights movement 1956 to 68, a project that provided a fresh examination of the visual and media culture of one of the most turbulent uh, social struggles in recent American history. The Civil Rights Movement was a social revolution unlike anything this country had ever experienced. It involved thousands of acts of individual courage undertaken in the pursuit of freedom. For the media and for photographers, it was an engaging, demanding, and sometimes highly dangerous story. Consequential images of the movement were made by dedicated artists, photojournalists, movement photographers, and amateurs alike, each with a distinct point of view. 
While their individual approaches may have differed, they all seem to have shared an awareness of the historical significance of the moment and understood that they were documenting a nation in tumult and transition. The photographs they made capture the hope and courage of the men and women who challenged the status quo, galvanized by the philosophy of nonviolence and the strength of their convictions. The images share a passion for justice and a rugged moral tone. They present the full range of poverty, brutality, and outright hatred, but also glimpses of hope and self-empowerment in the face of seemingly insurmountable uh, obstacles. Um, in a way, this, this question of, of the civil rights era, when does it begin, when does it end, is, is a movable target in a sense. Um, of course, you all know uh, of the terrible murder of Emmett Till in Money, Mississippi in the summer of 1955, a young boy from Chicago uh, who was brutally mur murdered and his body was thrown, thrown into the river. Um, not a year later, uh, Rosa Parks, a seamstress from Montgomery, Alabama, uh, was arrested, as, as every first grader in this country knows, for um, refusing to, to sit in the back of the bus, for sitting in the front, in the, seg you know, the segregated environment at that time. She sat in the front of the bus, defying um, the um, city regulations that African Americans should, should you know, keep to separate physical spaces in various kinds of public accommodations. Um, but this photograph, which is widely known and widely seen, um, does not portray the first time of her arrest because um, there was no media there at that moment. But a year later, when she was arrested for the second time, um, the, the media understood uh, the movement, I should say. Dr. King and the other members of the Montgomery Improvement Association understood the power of the photograph to tell their story and to help raise funds to allow their boycott to continue to happen. So this is, in a sense, I wouldn't call it entirely a staged photograph, but it's, there's a lot of self-consciousness about this picture. Mrs. Parks knows that she's going to be arrested again, and she's made plans to be arrested, and she's informed authorities and members of the media that that will happen. And so the photograph is made, and it becomes a very important fundraising tool for her movement. This, uh, for the movement, um, this is the original fingerprinting here that's in the National <coughs> Archives, just south um, of Atlanta. Um, here she is again. This is, you can see the date is December the 21st, 1956. And um, again, this is sort of just about a year after she was first arrested. And it, in a sense, it's like an anniversary photograph. It's like one year on, um, she is sort of acting out the uh, the circumstances of, original, of her original arrest. And this is a quote from her. Somebody must have told the reporters from Look magazine where I lived because they came out to the house and waited and waited until I'd finished doing whatever I was doing. Then I got dressed and got into the car with them and they drove downtown and had me get on and off buses so they could take pictures. <laughs> So it's revealing, really, that, that, uh, that that's what you're seeing here, a kind of reenactment of the circumstances of her original uh, act of, of sort of social protest. But if you imagine yourself, sort of, imagine yourself getting onto this bus, she's actually, the photographer's standing in the stairwell, which is right here. This is where you get on the bus. And this is the angle of view that you would see across this way. But this is the original drawing that was a court record here. So she was actually sitting on the other side of the bus. <laughs> so it's a small detail, but nonetheless important because it shows you the way that you know, history gets written. There are the, the kinds of errors that get made and how, of course, photography can be a fiction as well as being a fact. And so, uh, this, so this is a light motif through the civil rights era where we have many photographs that are, um, I would say, uh, as pure as the driven snow in terms of their authenticity, but also others that are concocted to some degree or fabricated to some degree. And this is um, where we get into this interesting dialogue, I think, around the notion of uh, the documentary and how one defines documentary. And I think two weeks from today, uh, in this very auditorium, there'll be a discussion with a few, a few experts to unpack that a little bit. It's an interesting uh, topic, I think. You know, what actually is a documentary photograph? What does it constitute? After World War II, the growth of independent news agencies such as the Associated Press, AP, and United Press International, UPI, was swift, bringing about a significant shift in the way that photographs were shared and disseminated. 
They could be exchanged and published with greater speed and ease than ever before. Wire photo technology was in its heyday during the civil rights era, and agencies such as AP and UPI were under intense pressure to deliver newsworthy photographs for daily newspapers across the country. When they were covering the civil rights beat, agency photographers like uh, this chap here, Will Counts on the right-hand side, typically carried mobile darkroom equipment, allowing them to process the film and make wet prints on location. Once developed and processed, the still moist print was wrapped onto a drum scanner and transmitted by the <coughs> to the nearest news bureau. The goal was to get the image and the story transmitted as soon as possible where it could be printed and evaluated by editors for publication. For reporters too, being on hand to get the news and send it from the scene onto the wire was essential to stay ahead of the field. And this chap here, Alex Wilson, is a reporter who worked for the Tri-State Defender, an African-American newspaper out of Memphis, uh, one of the preeminent journalists of his generation, of, of regardless of, of skin, skin color or creed. He was an extraordinary journalist and was brutally beaten when he was covering the uh, integration of the Little Rock High School, which is the, this very famous picture on the left that probably most of you have seen before. Of Elizabeth Eckford was one of several students entering the school that day, and she's isolated here from her, the, the other eight students that joined her that day because she was a day early. She got there was a mix-up in the understanding of what, what day they were doing, and she ended up on her own entering the school, which is why she seems to be sort of so isolated and threatened by this crowd of, of girls behind her who are sort of berating her for her, for her actions. But um, Alex Wilson, just coming back to him for a second, this chap here with the Dumbo ears right here, <laughs> It's just about to rain a brick on his head. And uh, you know, this is the, the least chilling of the series of photographs that was made uh, that day. And you know, he suffered severe head injuries and was never, basically never the same after this event. Um, so this is a, a, a very kind of poignant photograph because it's almost like the last few moments of his regular life before he gets injured. Agency photographers routinely wrote their own captions for the photographs, and this information became an integral element in the evaluation of the image for publication by newsroom editors. And although many news photographers had been trained to use a speedy graphic camera, which is a 4 by 5 inch format camera that was commonplace um, from around about 1930 onwards, by 1960, by around this time, they were increasingly working with 35 millimeter cameras. This reduction in the size of their equipment improved mobility and allowed them to be less obtrusive while in the field. It was perfectly common for photographers to carry multiple cameras, each fitted with slightly different lenses, to be deployed as circumstances demanded. Establishing and then maintaining contact with movement leaders was key to landing a good story, as was knowing how and when to disappear when danger loomed. This is a photograph from 1960 that was made in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, 1960 is a very critical year in the movement because it's when the philosophy of nonviolence, as first sort of espoused most powerfully, I guess, by um, Mahatma Gandhi in India, um, was, if, if you like, imported into this country. And um, the city of Nashville was the hub for that. There were a trio of really important ministers there, um, C.T. Vivian, uh, Kelly Smith, and James Lawson, who taught a whole generation of young students the philosophy of nonviolence. They held these um, nonviolent training workshops where you would learn how to um, receive physical and verbal abuse without responding in kind. And this philosophy of nonviolence was to be the most powerful tool of the movement um, during this time. So this young, uh, this young man here and the girl who's sitting on the chair are kind of going through that, that training to learn how to be ready to then go onto the streets and to peacefully, peacefully uh, protest. Um, these are, this is part of a series of pictures made by James Corral, as Karen mentioned in, in her introduction. That's the, next, the last, most recent book that I've done. And uh, this was a really important series of pictures that he made on the uh, campus of Morehouse College, where Dr. King went to school, and Clark Atlanta, which is a historically African-American school <coughs> in the city of Atlanta. <coughs> so this is the kind of training that these young 18, 19, 20-year-old children went through 
before then going on the freedom rides or going to try to desegregate the lunch counters or going to the local library, that kind of thing. Um, leadership, uh, of course, is so critical to the, the civil rights movement, and that definition of leadership is quite is quite broad. I mean, obviously, we all know uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Here you see um, in his Atlanta office with uh, an image of, of Mahatma Gandhi on the wall, uh, and this this very photograph actually is the photograph that was used for the monument that is now on the mall in Washington. The sculptor who created that monument worked his image of the sort of crossed uh, on Dr. King from this photo. It's been quite, uh, quite, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, someone help me, what's, uh, uh, no, there's, there's a word, what is it? Uh, 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 something that's not done everybody support. It's been um, uh, controversial, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> So controversial, yeah, so that, the, the, the monument's been controversial, but this is where it comes from, it comes from this photograph, uh, which was made by Bob Finch, who was a, who worked specifically for Dr. King's organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Um, but Dr. King, um, an incredible orator, of course, in a freshly minted uh, PhD in theology from Boston University, uh, and, you know, the kind of leading figure of the movement, but on the left hand side you have Fanny Lou, Lou Hamer who was equally influential but came from such a different kind of background. She was one of 20 children from a, um, a plantation family deep in the heart of the Mississippi Delta and you can see you know, she's just wearing flip flops and her sort of summer dress. She didn't have really any formal education but uh, was extraordinarily important in that state, in her home state, helping to register uh, rural African Americans to vote helping them to, to take literacy tests and so forth. And it's, it's, it's those kind of foot soldiers of the civil rights movement that are really as important as uh, the work of great leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King and John Lewis and, and uh, Andrew Young and others that sort of came to prominence during this period. say much when you look at a picture like this, um, but uh, yeah, I'll just let that be. So this is really what motivated uh, a whole generation to try to stand up and do something. This kind of, of hate, this kind of uh, belief system uh, that young, young people started to to uh, rise up and try to find a way to make change. Um, these are the first two photographs by Danny Mine in this segment of the talk that I'm showing. Uh, the, the, this poster, some of you might be able to read it, but I'll read it for those that can't. It says, Atlanta is living a lie. Uh, and this is a group of young students coming uh, across the highway here. This is the, the kind of highway, the, the road, the bridge across the highway in downtown Atlanta. And they're walking from their campuses where you saw that nonviolent a training picture from Clark Atlanta, from Morehouse, into downtown Atlanta to uh, petition over the um, segregation in public accommodations, in hotels, and restaurants, and so forth. And they were willing and, and able, quite happy to go to jail um, for their protests. And uh, you know, Atlanta at that at that time was um, regarded by many Northerners as a sort of re relatively liberal, progressive city. Yet for African Americans, there were you know, there was a chokehold in terms of their personal freedom there. And this was the city that, that Danny Lyon you know, went to in order to become active. Um, he was a 20-year-old undergraduate at the University of Chicago studying history when uh, he first began to see images of the civil rights movement in various uh, campus newspapers and in the, in the Chicago Tribune and so forth and, and felt compelled to somehow get involved. So, um, in the summer of 1962, before his, you know, just as he was beginning to prepare for his final year at school, he came down to Atlanta and became involved with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And he was basically recruited to be their first official photographer out of their Atlanta headquarters. Um, as I mentioned, he was just 20 years old, um, and he, but he quickly became a valuable asset to them, bringing a raw talent and a sense of adventure to the enterprise. Um, in his work for this, for this organization, for SNCC, 
He was not tied to traditional newspaper deadlines or to any specific editorial brief, but had autonomy to choose whom and how to photograph. Essentially, he was free to explore events on the ground in his own distinctive way. He had direction from a man called James Foreman, who was the executive director of that organization, and Julian Bond. There's pictures of both these characters upstairs in the exhibition. Uh, Julian Bond was the uh, communications director, and they had a very sophisticated strategy for how they were going to uh, communicate to the larger world uh, the, the issues of, of, of segregation and um, inequality, um, not just in the, in the rural south, but in, in the cities as well. Uh, there's James Foreman on the left-hand side um, in his office uh, in Greenwood. So throughout uh, the southern states, the SNCC had smaller outpost offices where they would organize, they had a lot of community organizations, would get um, uh, local people to help them register to vote, and they would, as it were, arrive in those communities, educate and activate local people, and then the local people would then generate change and, and provide communication in their own communities. This is a picture on the right-hand side that Danny Lyon made from inside a paddy wagon. So he was arrested a number of times um, for, for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, and you know, he, he makes it very clear in his testimonials and his statements that he, he didn't consider himself an activist. And he, of course, he agreed with their cause, but he was there to make photographs. He was there to document what was taking place and to have his work try to make some, some difference. Uh, this is the uh, left-hand side, the Student Voice, which was the newsletter uh, produced by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And you can see very sort of literally here how photographs from the field were used. Sometimes they would use Danny Lyons' photographs, but other times they would use images that came um, from the various news agencies, and they would appropriate them and um, you know, write them up and, and give very specific and quite detailed information about what was taking place in the various different communities. I mentioned earlier on about how these photographs were sent across the newswire and the captions and so forth were, that were written. And this is very important, this information down here, and you'll see it in some of the other pictures that I'm going to show later on. But um, this, of course, is being reproduced in this uh, newsletter because these are young activists who have sort of aligned themselves with this organization. So um, this is the kind of, of newsletter that was sent to campuses all over the, the um, country, not just in the south, but all over the country, um, and as a way to provide really clear information about, about um, the different sort of, if you like, activism that was taking place across the country. Uh, on the left-hand side, a, a beautiful stirring picture that, that Danny and I made uh, on August the 28th, 1963, 50th anniversary this year, of the March on Washington, which was, you know, the largest civil rights march and gathering um, of, the, of its generation, really. And what you, you're seeing here is this very uh, image being transformed into a poster here. Uh, and this beautiful poster is the first thing you see when you enter, when you get off the elevator upstairs and you walk into the exhibition. And uh, it's, I mean, this amazing three-letter word, now, you know, change, now. Uh, you can see where... Uh, our present president may have got some of his inspiration, but down here um, is some interesting wording. And then when you when you go and see the object later on, you'll notice at the very bottom of the byline it shows that it's printed and and released <coughs> from from their offices in Atlanta, where Danny Lyon um, had a little sort of like a kitchen dark room where he made his prints and and helped uh, put these pamphlets and newsletters together. That was the kind of work that he did. Here are some other pictures he made that day. Uh, the, uh, not then, not necessarily that famous, but Bob Dylan, but of course he was going to become incredibly famous. There he is, he was just breaking through at that time. Uh, James Baldwin, of course, um, wonderful, great author, and Marlon Brando. Um, Harry Belafonte was another sort of public, uh, sort of uh, movie uh, performing artist personality who was very active in the movement and heavily subsidized uh, the, the activities of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, much more so than Dr. King's organization, which was called the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, so Belfonte was very active, and actually in, in 2010, when they had the 50th uh, reunion of SNCC, so to celebrate its founding, 
Belafonte gave an amazing sort of fire, firebrand speech there. I mean, I've never heard a speech like it ever. Um, uh, where you can tell he's still engaged with the same issues that he was 50 years ago in the most sort of powerful, passionate way possible. Um, so these are, these are the kind of <coughs> grassroots activities that, that Daniel Lyon also documented. This is uh, um, one of his fellow SNCC workers here um, on the porch you know, talking to this, uh, this, this woman on her front stoop, you know, basically giving her information about how to register to vote, telling her about community meetings and trying to help spread the word. And, and so a lot of the photographs that Daniel Lyon made, are not, they don't have great drama in them. They're, they're really sort of showing the basic work that, that young um, uh, folks did in the communities to try to get uh, people to be better informed about uh, the different possibilities and to, and to help sort of empower them to move forward on their own terms. Um, on the right hand side, the work of a woman called Doris Dervey, um, who was really a great discovery for me personally when I was working on this project. Um, the first African American PhD um, ever awarded by the University of Illinois, Obama. She was a PhD in anthropology. And uh, as a young woman, um, she was from New York, but she came down to the South and got involved in the Albany movement in South Georgia um, in 61, 62, and, um, and uh, used her skills, as a, her interest in media and her skills as a photographer to document the work that people like this woman here, Elsie Dorsey, was doing in her community. This is basically you know, a vegetable cooperative, like a kind of farmer's market environment. Um, in, in um, Shelby, Mississippi, a very poor part of Mississippi, and, and showing the kinds of, of positive images, really, the positive response of um, African American women who, in many cases, had been fired. You know, they may have been housemaids or had other kinds of jobs, but many of them were fired for registering to vote or, in other ways, protesting um, the segregated circumstances they found themselves in. So, so the work of Doris D Derby is really, really important. You're going to see her right here. Um, in this next image, this is her here, as, he, as a, just a few years before. This is her figure on the right-hand side of the frame here. She's wearing a SNCC badge right here, and with her kind of headdress. And um, a wonderful person, wonderful woman, who who um, made very significant documentation of uh, the work that was taking place in the American South during this period. Um, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, a great image. There are some others uh, that are part of the portfolio that, that the museum here has just acquired that are upstairs. Uh, Jim Clark was the, the sheriff, this figure here, in Dallas County, Selma. And, I mean, widely known for his ruthless, you know, approach. He's uh, regularly beat and harangue African-Americans uh, and had a terrible reputation. and. Uh, was written about in, the, in all the major newspapers and, and uh, singled out by a lot of photographers that came down there to try to document the situation. <clears throat> of course, we all know the tragic story of the bombing of the, of the 16th Street Baptist Chapel in, uh, in Birmingham. This happened you know, two or three weeks after the March on Washington, middle of September. 1963. Um, the four girls who were murdered that day attending Sunday school services were Annie Mae Collins, Carol Robertson, Cynthia Wesley, and Denise McNair. And, and these are the parents of Denise McNair. Look at that face. I mean, it's amazing. You just see her terrible loss and holding this picture of their young daughter who, you know, being so brutally taken. Um, there's a fabulous photograph in the exhibition upstairs that uh, Danny Mine was in New York when this happened, was immediately flown by SNCC down to, to Birmingham to sort of cover the story. And there's a, this particular, this, the, pic, the picture that's upstairs is very similar to this, there's just no figure in the window, but it shows the sort of smashed glass and how the building itself has been shaken um, by, by this sort of terrible uh, mercenary bombing that, that took place. This is a, a sort of a great picture by Daniel Lyon, um, typical of the kind of thing that he was able to do, a very wily character. Um, really sort of good about, good, good at talking his way into different situations. And here, he's in the, uh, in the funeral chapel for one of the children here. Um, so I love this image. It's so, it's so uh, touching and, and profound in many ways, this image of the Last Supper up here, and this young woman who's sort of peering down into, into the coffin. Uh, but uh, this is, there's no other pictures quite like this from, from that particular story. And, 
this is one that's sort of very rarely seen and, and published. So essentially, Danny Lyon was, was um, sent all around uh, the southern states by the SNCC office, usually by James Foreman, who was uh, the, the main person directing him. Um, in a way, this organization, SNCC, is a, has a very sort of flat um, uh, management system. There's no hierarchy. They were all basically the same age. Uh, Foreman was a little bit older, but he was the sort of one of the great leaders, and he had a very st strong bond with Danny Lyon, and would send him hither and thither to cover particular stories that were um, were important to record in, in one way or other. And Danny Lyon had a kind of credit card, so he could jump on planes and go from here to there to get to where the action was, and immediately make the pictures and send them back to the Atlanta office for their distribution to a larger um, network. Uh, what we're going to do now is just, uh, I'm going to show you a short piece of film footage from a documentary that I made with an uh, independent filmmaker a few years ago uh, that includes some uh, interviews with a couple of the young girls in this picture. So this is a photograph made in a place called Leesburg in, in south, southern Georgia, not far from where uh, uh, Jimmy Carter you know, was born and raised, uh, Plains, Georgia. So it's about an hour and a half southwest of, of Atlanta. And these young girls were, or were incarcerated for more than 25 to 30 days for simply trying to take books out of their local library in Americas. And um, held captive in this single concrete building for, for that period of time. And the segment that we're just about to see sort of brings that back to life. So I'm just going to tell you a few minutes, but. I think you'll find it quite interesting. <coughs> the first voice you're going to hear is the voice of John Lewis. Enough that you can cuff your hands and get enough water to wet your throat. 
I can hear that sometimes when I like a drug that, and it always aggravates me because it takes me back to that. What do you Leesburg was called at one time Lynchburg. They used to lynch black people in this town. There was a car that's coming down this little dirt trail to the stockade. We got excited. And I remember this black guy pulling up on the side of the building and he went to the back of it and unlocked the trunk and this white guy got out. It stopped right, right along here. Right, right along here. So I get out of the car and I, the, the building was a rectangle with a guard on one side so I went the far side away from it. And he's just yelling and screaming and stuff, you know, just excited like children would be. I, I and, um, looked through the window, so I saw all these girls, and they're far away, and that's the first shot. He said he was there to take pictures, and he was from the office in Atlanta. Then I moved the way around the side of the window, and where it was busted glass, I, you know, to get a better photograph. And all the women came right up to the glass. I had close-ups of them. One of them said, we'll show you how we live in here, and they laid down and recreated how they were asleep. We know that people would know that we were still alive, and that we was housed in this building. News came back to America that, that this had happened, and girls were released. We was brave young girls, even at that age, and we didn't know what fear was because we knew what we was doing was right. They got flags in here. Some places throw the flags, right? Well, Until that moment, I don't think I'd really been accepted into, in, into SNCC fully. After all, SNCC people were activists. Most of them went to jail routinely. They did things. It was one of their finest qualities. All I did was make pictures. But in America, my pictures had actually accomplished something. They'd gotten people out of jail. And one of the girls, uh, once she got out of jail, her name was Henrietta Fuller. Uh, submitted this, this sworn testimony um, the 13th of September 1963. She says, I'm 13 years old and was in the Leesburg stockade from August 31st to September the 8th. There were 32 kids in there with me. There were no beds, no mattresses, no blankets, pillows, no sheets. The floor was cold. You lay down for a while and soon it starts hurting you. So you sit up for a while and it starts hurting you. So you have to walk around for a while. The smell of the waste material was bad. I went to the bathroom there to urinate, but didn't have a bowel movement during the entire nine days I was there. There was a shower, but it wasn't clean enough for you to bathe in. At night, the mosquitoes and roaches were at us. In the middle of the week, the white man gave us some blankets. Two or three of us slept in one blanket. One of Daddy Lyons' uh, SNCC missions took him to Cambridge, Maryland in the spring of 1964. And there he made this extraordinary picture of a man called Clifford Bores, who was being violently apprehended by the National Guard. Clifford Bores was an African-American, of course, and a, a photographer working for the SNCC movement. So he was a kind of colleague of Daddy Lyons. Here he is right here. And he actually had um, uh, sort of arranged to get arrested. So I'll just read what Danny Lyons says. He says, that night Clifford Bores, who was from California and recently begun to make pictures for SNCC, handed me his flash, saying he didn't need it because he's going to be arrested. People were sitting down in the street. Someone held a bottle toward the guard troops. Then a guard tried to arrest Clifford. 
and a tug of war developed as demonstrators held his feet while the guards tried to pull him away. Um, but there's this great drama, and it's a very fairly mundane description in a way, but powerful drama um, in the way this picture has been made. But here's another view of it that's quite different. Um, this one um, is, is by um, a news photographer who was in attendance at the same event, a guy called George Cook, um, who was working for the Baltimore Sun. And uh, he's, he's making his picture from uh, a kind of elevated position, one of the buildings just behind where this action is taking place. And so let me just show you. This is, um, this is Clifford Bores down there, <coughs> sort of moments before the, the action he just took, saw took place. And this is Stokely Carmichael who went on to be a very you know, important member of the civil rights era movement. And this is Danny Lyon over here, back here. Um, and what's interesting is there's this whole kind of cast of news cameras here, and photographers, this guy here, this guy here. I mean, several media folks in, in, um, in attendance here. And it's interesting to me because Danny Lyon's really the only photographer who hasn't got his camera up to his face. You see, I was just looking, sort of waiting for the optimal moment to make the picture. And there's something really powerful about this image, I think, because you, you get this sense of you're in a front row seat, you're the only person there, you're up very close to the action, there's a kind of horrific um, uh, reality to the way this picture's been put together. But um, as we've already heard, in some senses it was pre-arranged, it was a set up to the, in the sense that Clifford Balls knew that he wanted to be arrested and he wanted to create a dramatic looking event that could then be photographed and, and uh, and then disseminated out to the larger world. So the, the, the civil rights organizations were very skillful in knowing how photographic images could help advance their cause. That's another picture that he made from that same night of Stokely Carmichael, amazing picture, just um, a few seconds after the crowd had been um, tear gassed, and you get a sense of the sort of drama from this young guy here who's, who's shirt is sort of spattered with uh, liquids and I think some blood as well, but you kind of see the anger and the, and the desperation of the young Stokely Carl Carmichael right there. Um, I'm going to move along a bit quicker now because I've already taken up quite a bit of time. Um, Birmingham, of course, Birmingham and Alabama was a, a real center for the civil rights uh, movement and um, this is where Dr. King, especially in his organization, um, had a lot of impact and, and made a, a lot of progress. There had been, of course, the terrible events taking place there throughout that, that summer. Um, uh, actually, the, 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 the bombing of the Birmingham Chapel was made after this picture was made, but it was a kind of terrible summer, the summer of 1963 in Birmingham. But these are young uh, school-age children um, out petitioning to be able to, to use public <coughs> facilities and, and uh, you know, not wishing to be excluded based on just exclusively on their skin color. Um, this is a good example of um, the kind of shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder nature of civil rights this time. Bruce Davidson and Bob Adelman, two photographers who made a lot of different pictures of the movement, and there, you know, you can get a sense of them standing literally right next to each other, making a, a picture a few moments apart. This woman here with the floral print, print dress is now in the back of the paddy wagon a few minutes later, and this wonderful placard that she, the cop is holding, Khrushchev could eat here, why can't we? <laughs> and this is Loveman's, which was the big, big department store in Birmingham, which uh, you know, did not allow African Americans to sit at the lunch counter or use their toilet facilities, that type of thing. So it was a kind of hub of their different um, uh, demonstrations and so forth. Very famous picture that probably many of you know um, that was captured on May the 3rd, 1963 by Bill Hudson, a photographer working for the Associated Press. Um, uh, this particular guy, Hudson, was a former paratrooper and had um, you know, a lot of experience of, of police hostility towards fellow journalists and um, you know, would keep his camera under his jacket most of the time before bringing it out at the optimal moment. In this case, um, this young guy here, Walter Gadsden, is you know, being sort of pulled in towards the cop and this, while well, this uh, Alsatian dog lunges at his midriff. Um, and, and this is this image, you can see it ran the very next day in the New York Times. And, um, you know, these are the kinds of pictures that, uh, you know, caused President Kennedy to be outraged and to really realize that, that you know, some kind of federal action had to take place in order to, to um, you know, prevent the sort of you know, international embarrassment that was, was 
beginning to get quite out of control. <coughs> of course, King, uh, uh, JFK was going to be um, you know, brutally murdered not long after, and it took another year of <coughs> President Johnson to pass the Civil Rights Act on July 2nd, 1964. Um, the, the, the fire, the water hosing pictures are um, perhaps some of the most profound and, and powerful and uh, beautiful pictures that were made um, during this time. Just go back to that for a second. I mean, just, you know, to me, this is as, as uh, you know, I think this is one of the most uh, extraordinary photographs of the 20th century in this country. Um, I think it's beautiful and uh, just, you know, quite, quite extraordinary with the sort of emotion and also sort of visceral politics that it presents simultaneously. Uh, Charles Moore was a photographer who, perhaps more than anybody else, I think made the most uh, amazing pictures that, that day or during that those series of demonstrations in the spring of 1963. Uh, his work was reproduced in a glossy 11-page spread in Life magazine, large scale, you know, much more uh, better quality reproductions than you would find in the newspaper. Um, I, I don't think there's a picture that better illustrates that sort of line from the song, you know, we shall not be moved as this you know, muscular, powerful African-American man who's soaked through the skin, but still resisting this fusillade of water that's coming at him. And in this image here, I have to tell you that when I first saw this picture um, in New York, in a, in, a gal in a private gallery there, I was kind of shaking when I saw it because it was so beautiful, because you can't really see it in the, in the reproduction here, but you can just about see this woman's expression and then down here, it's really this finger, out, outspread hand, that she's kind of keeping her whole body weight from falling on that hand, and, and her wedding ring is sort of glinting in the in the um, fire. So it's uh, you know we know that she's um, a wife. She's probably also a mother, but she's still in, in this situation trying to make a difference. Just a few pictures here to finish out um, uh, this. Uh, difficult to talk about really this image on the left hand side this hotel owner in Florida who's pouring acid into the pool uh, because there are mixed race uh, folks recreating in this pool and Dr. King and his partner um, in, in crime so to speak uh, Ralph Abernathy went down to, to this motel to uh, try to engage with this guy and to talk him you know, to sort of non-violently talk him out of his uh, mindset and to, to try to explain why it, it was not a, a uh, particularly you know, humanitarian thing to, to not allow people to, to swim together in his pool. And they were, he was somewhere, they were both arrested and sent into the Johns County Jail. So this is a picture of King and uh, Abernathy in jail, one of the you know, umpteenth time that, of course, King was arrested for his different um, acts of social protest. Um, you know, I've been talking about non-violence, of course, as being um, you know, the main thrust of this era, but um, gun violence and violence in general of a, of a kind of more extreme kind was ever present. And as the, as the 60s continued, uh, guns became more and more prevalent. You see the uh, Watts riots here in 1965, and then on the right-hand side, a photograph from Bogalusa, Louisiana. And, uh, you know, the, this is the kind of... Uh, uh, you know, muscular military and and, uh, and uh, kind of armed uh, situation that these young people, mostly young people, were were trying to counteract. Um, I want to just backtrack very quickly and read you um, it's a little bit out of sequence here, but a letter that, that to come back to Danny Lyon before we finish. Um, that he wrote to his mother and father in February of 1964, uh, where he's talking about the work that he's made in the South and his relationship to SNCC. Um, I, I need to be clear that he, you know, he was an undergraduate student when he first went down there. He went on many different missions, and then he went back to school to finish his degree. And in the summer of '63 is when he made the lion's share of the pictures that I showed you. Uh, but you know, a year later in 64, by about the summer of 64, he'd become tired of the movement and wanted to move on and do some other things. And this is a, a letter that he writes to his mother and father, with whom he was very close, and, and um, he talks about his work in the South. He says, I'm very involved in the SNCC organization and doubt if I would be so easily replaced. 
I'd rather be making a movie or money or generally enjoying myself, which is the main thing I don't get to do in the South, for someone that fits into the movement. Excuse me. Yeah, for someone that fits into the movement, which even Northerners can do if they're around long enough, to leave is generally regarded as traitorous or anyway a kind of retreat morally. It is part of the ethic down here. Frankly, I'd love to leave. I'd like to go to New York and hobnob with people who dig my pictures or go to Chicago and be with my friends. This mood comes on me every two months or so and is the thing that sent me home on these occasions when I left the South this summer. The trouble is I always come back because I want to and because I feel I have to. In many ways, I think that the things I do here are good for me. I have responsibility in my work. Somehow, because of the movement and the conditions of the country, I feel forced to face this responsibility. Um, in the particular form, it means doing SNCC pamphlets instead of riding and photographing motorcycles, which I would rather be doing. I'm very aware that the lure of New York is the lure of fun and irresponsibility. None of us want to be here. Foreman would like to be writing. John, John Lewis, wants to go to Africa, and they all really want to leave, but of course they can't. <coughs> the system remains. Segregation has not yet fallen. Only victories keep people here. I guess they keep me here, my little victories, a poster that makes money for SNCC, even selling pictures and passing the check on to SNCC. These small things have, for a brief moment, given me a satisfaction previously unknown. I don't think I'll stay forever. I'd like to try to do something else. Eventually, I'll decide what that is, the bike riders, and I'll leave for a while anyway. And this is where, in a sense, the you know, one piece that I talked about, the movable target of history, but this is where uh, it, it ends, in a sense, with King's terrible assassination in Memphis in 1968, in April of 1968. But you know, people like John Lewis keep that story alive. Here he is. Um, 40-some years later with Danny Lyon um, in, in um, Raleigh, North Carolina at the 50th, uh, I mentioned earlier on, the 50th uh, anniversary union of uh, the SNCC organization. Um, thank you very much for your time. composed like 
If you see that same picture 10 years ago, it lose some kind of vitality. But there seems to be, even the word movement, there is a lot of movement in our speech, and because it represents that period so well, I think it, we can pull it out. Yeah, I think that that's very well said. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. You spoke about his relationship with the prisoner, um, was it James Renter? J J James Renton, Jimmy Renton. Renton. Yes. Yeah. Um, but what was what was so compelling about that relationship for him? He didn't ever photograph him inside the prison. So is there is there was there some what what kept that relationship going to the level of intimacy that that? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, he did actually make sort of snapshots of him, but nothing that he would sort of call like an art photograph. Right, so, right. Um, you know, it's I think you. I sort of sound like a book publisher. You have to read the book. I mean, it's really amazing. <laughs> but because it's it's a sort of it's a it's like a call and response, you know, because you have the letters that Renton wrote to him that Danny Lyon has, you know, at his home in New Mexico, and then you have the letters that Lyon wrote to him that he hadn't read for four, you know, thirty years, but he got them back when the archive, you know, when his possessions were shipped to him in his house. So, you know, he's sort of going back through 30 years worth of correspondence and reconstructing what that relationship was like. A couple of times he also, you know, actually escaped from prison, was captured and re, you know, reincarcerated. So it's a crazy, I mean, it should be a movie. It's like a crazy the story. But I think, you know, what, what, um, What's interesting about, this isn't really answering your question, but what's interesting about that book and, and the exchanges they have is that, is that you know, Lyon knows that he's a, a very flawed human being. He knows that he's a criminal. He knows that he should be behind bars, but he has this crazy empathy for him somehow. He's sort of part of who he is, understands and connects with him. And uh, you know, that's what makes his work, I think, powerful photographically because he has an immersive sort of relationship to his subjects, whether they are prisoners or bike riders or uh, civil rights you know, activists, um, or, I mean, less so than the work he did recently in China because he was sort of parachuting in and out. But, you know, that's sort of how he rolls. You know, that's been the way that he's made his work for 40 years. And the first slide I showed was it said photographer, filmmaker, writer. And I mean, I read a couple of his things. He's a very good writer. And so these three things are kind of roiling around together. And they're all kind of working off each other. So photography is just one element of the way that he kind of captures and, and preserves how he feels about people and about things and culture. And I think, you know, as a, as a European, you know, I, I'm, I'm you know, constantly learning about American history and culture. And I think Danny Lyons, you know, his, his view of what he's tried to say about America and actually the Americas, because he's worked in Mexico a lot, he's worked in um, Colombia and other countries, you know, and, he's, and he lives in a, a very interesting kind of Chicano, Native American community. You know, he's, he's always trying to sort of look at, you know, what the definition of America is and what his relationship is to it. He's extremely well read. He's read, read more history than any, probably anybody I know. And yet he's this kind of maverick dude, you know. So he's a, you know, it's complex. It's very complex. And uh, but I've seen him kind of almost move to tears when he talks about these criminals that, you know, that he's corresponded with and who've been as important. I mean, they're on his family albums next to his kids. These people. It's bizarre. But that's, you know, that's what it is. Thank you. Yes. The civil rights movement began before '63. Yes. Was he involved in it? Uh, in New York as a youth? No, he was no, he wasn't. He, he was meant to be a very from a very middle class family. His father was a doctor. Um, his brother, you know, he has one sibling as a doctor, um, and he was kind of expected to go that route, but he didn't. Uh, and but he was in Chicago. That was sort of where he he studied history as an undergraduate in Chicago, and he goes sort of from there, as I mentioned earlier, on straight to the south. So. You know, then he goes back to New York in the mid '60s. There's some wonderful pictures in the show that he made when he lived back in New York, and that's when he got connected with the art world. People like Robert Frank and Mark De Souza, the sculptor, and others. But he, you know, it was through reading magazines and you know being an informed, you know, smart, informed uh, college student as he said, "Well, you know, these other people are taking the freedom rides and getting involved. You know, I love photography. I have some aptitude at it. Let's do that. Let's do it." But you know that you saw that amazing footage with those women. You know, mm -hmm. who, I mean, when I went to that place with them, I mean, I, it was difficult to 
know what to do. I mean, I have goosebumps all over my body, and you know, these people standing there, these women, talking about what they've gone through. And they now, I mean, very, very active in that community, you know, talking about this year and educating the young children coming up. Um, it's quite profound to be able to meet them and to, to understand their story. Yes, maybe a couple of ways. I want to thank you so much. Uh, your work is so timely, and we need to understand what's going on and what our history has been. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Okay, uh, one more. Yeah. What's uh, Mr. Lyon working on at the uh, he is, um, he, you can ask him that question when he comes here a few, a few weeks from now. He's coming in April, isn't he? Yeah, you can come back and see him. He's a real character. You'll have fun with him. <laughs> Trust me. Um, he's uh, essentially, you know, he's got a wonderful family and, um, you know, he's busy with his family life. He's writing a lot. And uh, one thing I'm trying to do, sort of having gotten to know him over the last several years, is is sort of exploring his archive, thinking about, he's getting to that moment in his life where maybe a major retrospective is in order, you know, to look at how to put that together. Um, but, you know, I don't think if he was standing next to me, he'd probably laugh at me, but, you know, he's quite a, an ordinary character, you know, he's tricky, take, you know, it takes a while to break him down, so he's, he's figuring out, you know, he's figuring out, you know, how that might happen, but he's, He's been publishing, he has a trio of books with the Fiden Publishing House, and now he's working on, uh, there's a trio of books. The first one was um, uh, a, 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 a sort of series of photo essays that hadn't really been published. The second one was the work in China, and this last one is a kind of retrospective, but typical to Danny, he does it like back to front. So it's the most recent work first, and then it goes back to the early 60s. So he's active, you know, he has exhibitions here and there. Um, but he hasn't had a full major museum retrospective, and I think that needs to happen. I have one other question. Are you familiar with this book, Hands on the Freedom Club? It's all Danny's photographs, and it's all the original voices of those women that... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, it has been a few years since I looked at that. But, uh, I, I Thanks very much, everyone.